that was easy. Hi, so I want to talk about graph search, but now with weights. We talked about breadth for search before, which is a graph, and we want to figure out what is the minimum number of edges to traverse to go from one vertex S to another vertex T. But now what we're going to do is we're going to have a certain weight on each edge, a certain distance if you want to think of it that way. So this one, for example, if we wanted to go from S to this node along this edge, then we incur a cost of five units or whatever you want to consider. And what I want to know is what is the route that I should choose to get from S to T the fastest, the lowest total cost, the lowest distance if you want to prefer it that way. So how do we actually go about doing this? Well. The breadth first search algorithm will not work here because, for example, like this path right here has a total cost of 21, even though it only has three edges. But if we go along this way, the seven, then the one, then the two, then the three, then the three, then that has a total cost of 16, even though it has five edges. So it's not necessarily the case that the minimum number of edges is the minimum total cost because the cost can be arbitrary compared to the edge itself. So we need some kind of new strategy, but I kind of like the original strategy of going out one layer at a time and then stopping when you eventually reach T. The problem is that we don't really have that right here because we might think, we might think, okay, this five is the right go way to go because it's less than the seven, but the seven actually is the better way because of these other edges further down the line. So we need a smarter way going about, going about doing this. Well, what we can do is let's do a variant of the breadth for search idea where instead of going out one edge at a time, we pick which edge to go out on, which does not increase the total cost as much as possible. Okay. So as an example, well, I have absolutely no idea in advance whether or not this S node is connected to any other node at all. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna mark each node as being, I can't find you. Your distance is infinitely far away. I have no idea how to get to you. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna mark every other node in this entire thing as being infinitely far away until I see a proof otherwise. And S, I don't need a proof, that is a distance zero from itself, obviously. And it kind of makes sense, of course, to not have a negative weight on these, because if I had a negative weight here, it might be possible to go all the way around and end up back at S with a negative total cost. And so I can just go around that loop as many times as I want, and that's not going to help me very much. I want to have something that is a meaningful representation of what a uh, road network or something will represent. Okay, so this zero right here, let's figure out how do I get from S to T? Well, it looks at the very beginning like this five is the good guy, right? This seven is the worst and 10 is even worse than that. But the five, of course, is not the best choice. So what we should do is maintain what things we can see at a certain distance. And when we see something that is better than that distance, let's update it. So like this is infinity, this infinity right here, it's better to go from S, which has a total cost of zero, along this edge, which has weight five, to get to here. Well, I currently have a way of getting to here with infinite cost, but now I found a way to get here with five cost, which is much better than what we had. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna update this guy with weight five, okay? Well then now, so now we've explored that vertex, so these two vertices we've seen, but the problem is now, what we need to do is to update what we can actually see. Well, if we go along, let's say that edge right here, well that will eventually give this thing a cost of 18, which is, might be worse than going along this one right here. So let's only explore whenever we find a way to get there as fast as possible. And what do I mean by that? So let's look at the vertices that we currently have as like a big bubble right here. And let's find the fastest way to escape the bubble, whatever that is. And taking into account the costs of the nodes that we currently have looked at, so this five and this zero. So here, if we go out this edge right here, going out of the bubble, we will have a total cost of 13 because this guy is five, this, this edge is eight, and so adding them up is 13. We go along this one, as we said, this was 18 total. 
and we have two choices over here. We can go along the seven, which will give a total cost of seven, and this one, which has a total cost of 10, because zero plus 10 is 10. So now let's go out as little as we possibly can using as little cost as possible. Well, here, that clear winner is right here because of this seven right here. So I'm going to now change my bubble to include that node, exclude that middle guy, and then now I'm going to update the cost of the of that node to be seven because that is the new proof that I just found that it has lower cost than infinity from s. Okay, so then now let's explore what things we can see from here. So this one has weight thirteen. This one has weight eighteen, or, or this node will have weight eighteen, I should say. Well, here this node right here has a weight of 8 or 10 depending on which way we come well the 8 clearly the winner compared to all these other guys so again i'm going to explore as little as i possibly can so this bottom node is the one that's going to be included now so these four are going to be in my consideration now well, actually, the S node doesn't need to be considered anymore because we looked at every single way of going out of it. And since there's no negative cost edge, then I'll never have a way of getting back to S with a smaller cost anyway. So we could remove S from consideration, but there's not really a, any reason to. Okay, well, then this guy right here, we got to update to be 8. All right, so we updated that guy to be 8. So then now what we need to do, of course, is to explore as little as possible. Well, this node right here will have a weight of 10 from here. So this guy is going to have a weight of 10. Well, this one's going to have 13. This is going to have 18. It's pretty clear what the winner is. So this guy is going to be included in our, our little green set right here. This one's going to be updated to be 10. And then now again, we got to pick which way to get out as quickly as possible. Well, this one is 14. This one's 13. This is 18 and this is 13. Well, we could choose either of the 13s because they are of the same cost. It doesn't actually matter which one you pick. So here, let's let's pick this guy. So when we pick that guy, this infinity is going to be replaced with is going to be replaced with 13. And then now we're going to include him in our green set right here. So I think we have those vertices picked. So then now let's consider um, all the ways of getting out. So the 13 coming out of here will give a total of 17. Here it's going to be 15. Here it's going to be 13. And this is going to be 14. So the 13 here is the winner because it was the next in line. So here I'm going to update our set to include that vertex. And its cost is going to now again be 13. Okay, so we got 13 there. Well, then now let's look at all the ways we can get out. So 13, we can go 17 there, 16 there, 19 here, because 13 plus 6, and 14 here. Well, the 14 is the winner, obviously. So therefore, this node is going to be updated to be 14. So that's going to be 14. And we're going to update our set right here. And so therefore, the only ways we can come out here are the 4 and the 3. And so therefore, the 3 is going to be the winner. So the infinity is going to be replaced with 16. And we have explored every single vertex of the graph, which is pretty dang cool. So what we have done here is we have explored the graph one pseudo level at a time. But it's kind of like a mountainous terrain where you're going ahead in one direction and then maybe catching up in another one at some later point and maybe that one's ahead and then this one eventually catches up and etc. So it's a, kind of like a more fine-grained breadth for search in some sense because you're not necessarily going the same number of edges every single time, not taking the structure of the graph into account. But here we're kind of doing that because we're looking at the edges to minimize the lowest cost we can do escaping the bubble that we have. And since we're always looking at the minimum cost to escape the bubble every time, whenever we reach T, that is the lowest cost of getting there because there's no other way to get to T faster because there's no negative weights in the entire graph. Everything is of weight zero or higher. So maybe there's multiple ways of getting to T, that's totally possible, 
but there's always a lowest cost associated with T because every weight is either zero or positive. So this is what is called Dijkstra's algorithm. So Edgar Dijkstra came up with this algorithm famously on a napkin, I think, <laughs> and is pretty important for computer science because if we wanna find out the fastest way to drive, let's say from somewhere to somewhere else, then all we need to do is just run Dijkstra's algorithm from wherever we are to the intended destination. And that will give us the route. How does it actually give us the route? Well, whenever we explored the edge for the first time, when we found that 16, we can say, oh, that node that just came, we just came from, that's the one that we should have T's parent be here. That's the way that we got to T in the shortest way to get to T. And so therefore, whatever this node pointed to going back, that's the way that we can reconstruct going from S to T just by going backwards from however Dijkstra's algorithm chose the, the edges here. So how do you actually implement Dijkstra's algorithm? Well, the idea of using the queue from breadth first search is the same idea, but now we gotta in encounter the weights. And we needed to figure out the lowest cost way of escaping. So we need some kind of structure that allows us to extract the minimum over and over and over. So we put a bunch of numbers into some structure and I want the minimum every single time. Well, we could sort the thing, right? But the thing is we're exploring the graph and these weights are not really known in advance, the weights of the nodes right here. So what we need is some kind of on the fly calculator as to figure out what the minimum value is in a set and remove that value from the set and recompute what the minimum is. And of course that is known as a min heap. So a heap is just a structure that keeps either the minimum or the maximum at the root and everything else below it is less than or equal to or greater than or equal to depending on which heap you have. Well, if I have a min heap here, then that means that I'm gonna always choose the minimum. And heaps are designed, depending on the heap that you choose, to have log n performance if there are n nodes in there. So what is the runtime of this thing? So the cost of extraction from a min heap, so extract is big O log N. And the cost of insertion is also log N. Well here, the graph, we could in principle put every single node into the graph, that's totally possible. And so therefore the cost of putting all the nodes in and then eventually taking them out is big O, the number of vertices log the number of vertices. So the runtime of Dijkstra's algorithm it's gonna be big O of the number of vertices log the number of vertices, but also we need to consider each edge, possibly a constant number of times, but still only a constant number, because once we explore an edge, then we'll never use that edge later because we just explored one vertex and then now we're going to explore another one. And it doesn't make sense to go backward because there's no negative edge weight cost here. Each edge will be accessed only a constant number of times, and so we got to add in the number of edges in here. In case the number of edges is extremely big, then that's going to swamp this runtime. But if the edges is small, then the V log V is going to win. So it just really depends on how dense the graph is in terms of the number of edges. But I got to add the number of edges into the calculation here. And that's the runtime of Dijkstra's algorithm. It's just a really simple generalization of breadth first search. Question for thought, try to make this work with negative weights and try to figure out when can you run Dijkstra's algorithm with negative weights. So like as an example right here, so if I made this, for example, a negative three, I think it will still work. I'd have to check to be absolutely sure, but I think this three can, without loss of generality, be made negative. But if I made the three and the four negative, then it will not work. So it just really depends on certain parameters of the graph. Try to think about what you actually need in order for a graph to not work with Dijkstra's and try to come up with a way to solve this shortest path problem from some node S to some node T with as little cost as possible, including those cases where Dijkstra's algorithm does not work. So hopefully that was interesting. Leave thoughts about Dijkstra's algorithm into the comments down below. As always, please like the video and subscribe to the channel. It really helps us out. 
There are many other links in the video description if you want to support the channel further. And as always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. That was easy. That was easy. That was easy.